Okay, so we are in our series, When I Met Jesus. We're right in the thick of it. We'll be looking at primarily, obviously, in the life of Jesus when he's encountering people of various kinds from the, like the high and the lofty religious and civic leaders of the day to the very lowly outcast um, to last week we looked at, what about when Jesus encounters a storm? Like, how does Jesus meet with the creation that he made? And today, we have another interesting one, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego met Jesus. And you might be thinking, hang on a second, I remember that story from Sunday school. Wasn't that in the Old Testament? Isn't Jesus in the New Testament? Uh, Well, yes and yes. And so we're going to see where we go today. We could also call this uh, sermon, What to Do When Life Doesn't Go Your Way. And so... Uh, I, I do, like, I'll introduce a little bit about what's going on because we're not in the New Testament, we're in the Old Testament. We're looking at a pre-incarnate, what's called a theophany or a revealing of God in person. And so when we see sometimes throughout the Old Testament, we see uh, Jesus actually coming pre-incarnate and walking among his people. Often, I mean, so, some people would suggest that when you read an angel of the Lord or a messenger from God, it's a regular kind of angel or messenger. But when it's the angel of the Lord, it's specifically referring actually to God himself and even Jesus pre-incarnate. So we're now, we're in the book of Daniel. I'm going to read a whole chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. It's where this story is found. Book of Daniel, the story happens about 600 years before Jesus Uh, before his earthly ministry. And so uh, the people of God had been living in the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel has already been, I mean, essentially obliterated. The southern kingdom of Judah has just been conquered by Babylon. And uh, if you're doing the, like the Bible in a year series, uh, you know, tracking through with, the rest of the church or people who are participating, uh, you would have finished Isaiah recently and heard about King Hezekiah and him welcoming people from Babylon to see all of the wealth of uh, the Jewish people. And then it's the Babylonians who come in and say, yeah, we'll take that, yoink. And so this story happens, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, happens in this period of time when the people of God have been conquered and subsequently taken into Exile in Babylon. And so that whole process of taking people out of the land that God had given them into exile or into uh, another land started with the king. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, let's get all of the young, good-looking, highly intelligent, noble young men in particular. Let's bring them over. We will... Make them like us. We'll teach them our ways. We'll make them Chaldeans, essentially, uh, like Babylonians. And we will assimilate them with us so that they are no longer meaningfully Jewish. That was the plan. And in that way, not only would they conquer the people of God, they would obliterate the people of God. Because within a few generations, it becomes so assimilated that any Jewishness would have been totally gone. And so this is where we're at. Starting with these four young men. Daniel, who you would have heard of. He's the famous Daniel from the lion's den, for example. You would have heard of that guy. Uh, And three of his friends, one called Hananiah, one called Mishael, and one called Azariah. But when they got into Babylon, they couldn't keep their Jewish names. And so Daniel was called Belshazzar. And the other three were called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so this is, this is the story. And they were born into noble families. <clears throat> These were the up-and-comers. These young men were highly intelligent. The Bible tells us they were good-looking. They had big potential. They're the people who, if they hadn't been conquered by Babylon, likely would have been the religious or civic leaders or business leaders in their future. Like the world was their oyster, basically. They were the cream of the crop, of the people, their future was bright, but now that future did not eventuate for them. Now there are conquered people. Many of their friends and family have been slaughtered. 
Others have been left behind and some have been taken into captivity with them and many, many, many more will follow. They were most, most likely made eunuchs because they were put in with the, the court of the eunuchs. They had a lot robbed from them, trained to serve in the court of a foreign king in Babylon. And so life for these four young men has not gone to plan. Not even not gone to plan. I mean, they might have had really great plans for their lives. But even like, you know how you go, well, the, here are my plans, but even if I don't hear those plans, then you know, life will still be okay. And maybe for us living in Australia, we have so many safety nets, uh, whether it be financial or social or cultural. And certainly in a, in a church community um, like this, we have great safety nets around us for when life goes horribly wrong. And so they might have thought, well, even if we don't like, live up to our full potential, at least life's going to be really fine for us. That's not what happens at all for these guys. In fact, life turns out significantly worse for them than for the average person in an unconquered Jerusalem, where they're from. But as it was, Jerusalem was conquered. Because, you know, and as in our day, being born into a wealthy family has many advantages. Uh, being naturally highly intelligent has some adva- advantages. Be, even being good looking, it's well documented, being good looking, I'll take, it, I'll take your word for it, has some advantages just in life. And so the, these young men don't just lose their advantages and become like everybody else. They're essentially kidnapped, neutered, lose their heritage, and even pressured to worship other gods. So again, We're not talking about life that's kind of gone slightly off track. We're talking about life that's been absolutely derailed. That's where we're at. And so what we'll see is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or for our purposes today, when Jesus met Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, will help us to know what to do when life doesn't go to plan, when life disappoints us, or when through no fault of our own, um, life hurts us significantly or people hurt us significantly or when we're really lost and don't know like, where we're at in life or what's going on in life, uh, when it doesn't look like God's in control, <clears throat> when someone else's sin makes a wreck out of our lives, these guys can relate. And how they go through this period of suffering is very helpful for us. And at the... Kind of at, the, at the pinnacle of this, we'll see them standing with Jesus. So a little bit, a little bit more background. So chapter 3, that's what we're going to, about to read. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar essentially sets himself up as God. In the, in the previous chapters, he had a really like, terrifying dream. He gets all of his wise men together and he says, I had a dream, you've got to tell me what it means. And they say, no worries, king, tell us your dream, we'll tell you what it means. He goes, no, if I've got to trust that you have the interpretation, I want to hear that you also have the dream. And they say, that's impossible. Nobody can do that. And so he says, fine, you're all going to die. And so people go out from the court to get all of the wise men, all of these eunuchs like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego uh, to kill them all because he didn't trust any of them. And the word comes to Daniel. He gets his friends together to pray. God gives him the answer. He tells King Nebuchadnezzar, the people are saved, but, but more so King Nebuchadnezzar goes, wow, God, he is amazing. The God of the Jewish people, Yahweh, is the true God over all gods. His dream was about a big statue. And yet, fast forward a few years later, we get to chapter 3, and it's Nebuchadnezzar who's making a big statue. He gets this idea probably from his dream. And he's now making a big statue, setting himself up as God. So th- let me read this chapter, and then we'll see what happens when... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego met Jesus. So King King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet high and nine feet wide. This would be an imposing, like gargantuan statue. He set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to assemble the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to attend the dedication of the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar set up. So the satraps, prefects, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the province assembled for the dedication of the statue the king had set up. All the important people were there. He got everybody. Everybody who had influence over anybody was there so that the king, Nebuchadnezzar, 
could ensure everybody is worshipping him. Then they stood before the statue Nebuchadnezzar had set up. A herald loudly proclaimed, People of every nation and language, you're commanded. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, you are to fall face down and worship the gold statue the king Nebuchadnezzar set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and every kind of music, people of every nation and language fell down and worshipped the gold statue the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Some Chaldeans took this occasion to come forward and maliciously, maliciously accuse the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. You as king have issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music must fall down and worship the gold statue. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are some Jews who have appointed to manage the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men have ignored you, the king. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. Then in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar asked them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I've set up? Now if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue I made. He's giving them a second chance. <clears throat> These guys had essentially saved his life before. And he set them up as, as governors over really important parts of his kingdom. He really, he really liked these guys. He was outraged that they hadn't obeyed him. But he doesn't want to just go kill him. He's like, please, you might not have heard properly the first time. If you please, fall down and worship. But if you don't worship it, he goes on, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. <coughs> Then, King, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with, filled with rage and the expression of, on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times more than was customary and he commanded some of the best soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So these men in their trousers, robes, head coverings and other clothes were tied up and thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Since the king's command was so urgent and the furnace extremely hot, the raging flames killed those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and called, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out. <clears throat> so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. When the satraps, prefects, governors, and king's advisors gathered around, they saw the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair on their head was singed. Their robes were unaffected, and there was no smell of fire on them. Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They visited, sorry, they violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I issue a decree that anyone of any people, nation, or language who says anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb and his house made a garbage dump. For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. Then the king rewarded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. All right, we've got a bit of ground to cover. Let's pray and ask God to help us today. And so, Father, again, we want to thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. As we hear about, or as we just read about uh, this uh, event that happened, we 
I mean, it's, it's amazing. We see a saving power. We see faithfulness of your people and your faithfulness towards them. We see again your <clears throat> supremacy over all other authorities, all kings and powers and principalities. And so today as we hear your scriptures read, help us please to be attentive to your Holy Spirit, to grow up into the likeness of Jesus we've just read about, to think more like him, to speak more like him, to love more like him, to be faithful like he is faithful to us. I pray this in his name. Amen. Okay, so very famous piece of scripture. Very famous story. Uh, it's the stuff of, you know, Sunday school, veggie, veggie tales. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of a, it's a kind of a cute kind of story until things happen like, is, like what's happening in our day today. And we hear of stories on the ground in the same areas of the kinds of conquering, or at least the kinds of war that leads to this kind of conquering that's happening, and the brutality of war. There's not a, there's not a cute Sunday school story. And the, these men, although you never hear them waver in this, this part of the story, they don't waver at all. And you think, well, that's not really relatable, right? But it's, it's just giving us, an, it's giving us the overview. It's giving us the, the dot points. But it's also giving us, I think, a really wonderful example. So what's happening is uh, this king, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he is setting himself up as God. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to gather every nation, tribe and tongue to come to him, to worship him at the sound of the music or they'll be thrown into the flame of fire. And if you're thinking, that sounds a little bit familiar, it's because it's basically an inversion of the gospel. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation will come and bow. Except for King Nebuchadnezzar, this is not an invitation. It's not, a, it's not respond to the love that I have for you. I want to save you from the fire. This is on the pain of death you must bow. It's a counterfeit gospel. It's the wrong gospel. It's worship me as God, is what King Nebuchadnezzar is saying. The musicians make music for me. Every tongue worship me, is what he's saying. Many counterfeit gospels present like this. In our day, we've got a couple of counterfeit gospels that present like this. The one, there's others that, uh, I mean this one, sorry, tries to have more imminent punishment than the wrath of God. It's saying, man, you better, you better bow. If you don't bow, if you don't acquiesce, if you don't agree, if you don't say the thing, or from Seinfeld, if you don't wear the ribbon, we'll get you. Your life is on the line if you don't align. We have this to a varying degrees today as well. So bow down to the idol of the day, bow down to the dominant culture of the day, bow down to the, the thing, or we'll roast you. Everyone else is doing it. Look around. Probably in the day, tens of thousands, if not Hundreds of thousands of people would have been at this magnificent occasion. Every single one of them bowing down, except for four people, a king and three young Jewish men. Everybody else is doing it. Imagine the pressure. Just not even, even if no one had said, you all have to bow, otherwise we're going to kill you. Even if no one had said anything, if everybody else, tens of thousands of people start doing a thing and you're one of three people not doing the thing, you're going to feel incredibly conspicuous. Probably starting to think to yourself, <laughs> have I got it right? What are the chances that out of hundreds of thousands of people, I have a, say, one in 100,000 chance to be right about this? These three men, they'd lost everything in their lives. They'd lost their homes. They'd lost their families, their temple, their nation. They'd lost their ability to have kids. Not, not by choice, none of that by choice. 
the life, their lives looked so promising as young people and now they are about to be thrown into fire. And yet, they don't bow. Last week we saw disciples facing a storm and not out of faith but out of fear, they run to Jesus. They run to him and say, we need your help. These three men today, they don't face a storm. They're face to face with a king, the most powerful king in his day. Surrounded by people from every tongue and every tribe on earth, at least the ones they could find. All of them bowing. It's just three people in the face of the most powerful person on earth and hundreds of thousands of other people all bowing. The storm loomed large last week. Like they were, the disciples were utterly at the mercy of the storm, totally surrounded by the storm. The storm held the power, essentially, of, of life or death for the disciples. And similarly this week, for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they're totally surrounded. They have not only this massive 90 foot high domineering statue, hundreds of thousands of people, but also the most powerful person on earth face to face, saying, you must bow. And they say, we can't bow. Unlike last week, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are not impressed by the size of the storm. They're not impressed by the, by the power of the king. They're not impressed by how many people bow to their king. Because of their faithfulness to the surpassing greater glory of God. Again, we saw this last week. What terrifies the disciples? So they're afraid by the storm. Storm's going to kill them. They know, they know that they're dead. They're experienced fishermen. They know they're dead. They're like, oh, well, we're dead. Jesus, do you care? We're about to die. They're afraid of the storm. When Jesus calms the storm, they're terrified of Jesus because although they were surrounded by the storm, the storm looked large. All of a sudden, they realize they're in the presence of something with a higher authority and greater power. For Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they're in that figurative storm, totally surrounded, but they have the perspective that God is already greater. He already has the, the supremacy and the authority over every rule. The hope isn't even that God's going to save them. Although they say he could save us if he wants to, should he desire they say they refuse to bow even if he doesn't. So our allegiance is not to you. Our allegiance isn't to our lives. Our allegiance is to God. He is the one. We live for his glory alone. And you see this consistently in these guys whose lives, from an objective outside perspective, you'd go, you'd look at them and you would pity them. Wrenched from their families from a very young age like brutalized physically. Had their lives threatened over and over again at the mercy of multiple levels of people subjugating them. And now all of them coming together and trying to force the point, you must bow, you must bow. And these three young guys, the whole time, the perspective, they see things as they really are the overarching, undergirding glory of God far surpasses any of the awesomeness that they could see with their eyes. They're going to worship God in the good times. They worship God when they're dragged from their homes. They worship lives when, uh, God when their lives are threatened. They worship God when they, they're promoted. They worship God when everyone else bows to another God. And they continue to worship God <clears throat> even as they're thrown into the fire. They're worshipping him with their lives, with their steadfastness, with their faithfulness. Their allegiance to their king, their true king, never changes. And they are thrown into the fire. Sometimes, I mean, if for, for the average person, sometimes if we haven't abandoned God by now, like given all of the significant pressure, given the you know, being taken away from their lives, being surrounded by a culture that does not worship their God, but other gods or runs after other things, or has other values or pressures them to abandon their God. If the average person hadn't already abandoned God, being thrown into the fire 
might seem like a massive betrayal. We might interpret that as a betrayal. But the God, I was living for you the whole time. How's my life turned out so terrible? Can't you see I've been faithful and faithful and faithful and look at all the crap that keeps happening over and over and over again. People abandon God in these situations when they believed a kind of prosperity gospel that says God loves you and wants you to be healthy and wealthy and prosperous. Therefore, you can tell the degree to which God loves you by your health, your wealth, and your prosperity. And if that's what you believe, when you get when your country gets conquered, when you're kidnapped, rent from your family, neutered, you might say, screw you, God. You promised me awesomeness and look at my terrible life. Or when you continue to do the right thing and you continue to be faithful, even in all that suffering, and you, you know, interpret the dream and you continue to pray <clears throat> and then people come and try to kill you, you might go, God, what are you doing? And then when you keep doing the right thing and then you don't bow and then throw you to the fire, you might think, I was promised something else. That promise doesn't come from God. The promise, the consistent promise through Scripture for those who belong to Jesus, for the people of God, is suffering. That's the promise. That's the thing that Jesus promises us suffering. And Paul, he, he takes that up and he says, he not only promised suffering, but we share in his glories if we share in his suffering. So suffering is actually producing something in us. It's producing something in us now and producing something in us for eternity. So the suffering is not the thing like, there's one uh, about 20 years ago, great song uh, came out. It was called Still. I really loved it. Except there's one line where it said, you know, when, um, when, the, where said, when the rain comes and the flood comes up, uh, I will rise with you above the storm. And that's the prosperity gospel that says, God doesn't want you to have hardship. God doesn't want you to live an uncomfortable life. He wants to elevate you above that. And if you just had enough faith, you'd be up there. That's a lie. They're lies. And the consistent refrain of Scripture is, God is with you in the storm. Last week, God is with you in the storm. This week, God is with you in the fire. Over and over and over and over again. Suffering is producing something in us. God is leading us to or allowing us to go through suffering. And he's working it together for our good. People who abandon God in these, you know, as as the pressure gets harder or as life gets more difficult, might say things like, I tried praying, but it didn't work. I tried praying, but it didn't work. What that means is, I prayed that God would lift me above the storm and he didn't. My goal is to get out of the storm. For Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, their goal is not to escape with their lives. Their goal is to bring God glory and to prove their faithfulness to him. Our goals are not the same goals as the culture around us. As soon as we buy the goals of a culture, we're already we're already off track. We're already deceived. We will alre- we're already on the path to abandoning God because we'll think He is promising us things He never promised us. And we'll interpret <clears throat> the lack of those things as His disinterest, as His inability or His non-existence. Or our friends who don't know Jesus, don't have allegiance to Jesus, will point to us and say, I'll oh, see, how could a loving God do this, or look at what your faith in God has gotten you. Obviously, we're all going for the same goal. You haven't gotten that goal because of your allegiance to God. Therefore, your God has failed you. Whereas we need to have a different perspective. Our goals are not the same goals. Our trajectory is not the same trajectory. Our hope is not in the same things. Our anchor is not the same thing. Our foundation is not the same thing. We have a totally, totally different paradigm of reality. And so when we think, I tried praying but didn't work, or God didn't give me what I wanted because what I wanted wasn't God, 
And God wants to give us himself. He's made us to be satisfied in him. And we chase after things, dissatisfaction after dissatisfaction, because we think, because the world tells us that's what's valuable, that's what's gonna fulfill us, that's what's gonna satisfy us. We keep chasing those things, but we believe in the wrong gospel. Only God satisfies. And the goal of our heart is to be satisfied. The goal of our life is to be satisfied. And you continue, like uh, Augustine said, we will be restless. Our hearts are restless until we find our rest in Him. It's true. The reality for these three men is the pressure is too great. They can't be faithful to Jesus and escape with their lives. There's not a, there's not a, like, a like a fake choice. It's a real choice. Be faithful to God or die. Bow or die. And they choose die. And they say, even though we're choosing this, we know our God can save us. But they're not putting their hope in God saving them. They're saying, even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. Our hope is in him. Our hope is in him forever. As you, if you continue to read through to the end of Daniel, we read about like a resurrection and newness of life. And this is where their hope is. The hope is in eternity. And so these three men, pressure too great. If their ultimate goal is comfort or ease or to escape with their lives, the pressure is too great. But if it's to bring God glory, then their goal is lived out in faithfulness to God. And this is where they meet Jesus. They're thrown into the fire. <clears throat> Probably the, the furnace that was made to build the big statue. Furnace is still there. Giant furnace. Heated up hotter and hotter and hotter because the king's rage was also getting really hot. The men who went, like, walked up to throw them in, they perished. It was so hot. And what do we read? Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said, I mean, here, here, I mean, here's the situation again. He's made a big statue. It's pretty awesome. Invited people from around the world to come. They're all come. Music's playing. This is all for him, right? He made this happen. It's happened. Potentially hundreds of thousands of people all bowing down. Music blaring. He's like, this is awesome. Three dudes, not bowing. So it's like, wonderful, it happened. I'm, I'm the king. I'm like God. What's going on with these three dudes? And all of his attention comes over here. So all the while, people still music and, and whatnot, and he's focused on these dudes dying so that he can get back to the hundreds of thousands of people. But he can't. He's like, what the heck is going on there? We threw three guys in bound. Now there's four guys walking around in the fire. In case you don't know, people don't walk around in fire. Didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire, unharmed. The fourth looks like a son of the gods. Pre-incarnate Jesus, the word of God comes and stands alongside them. He shows his authority over the storm. Last week we read about it. He shows his authority over the flames this week. He is the greater authority. He's the one that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego already set their hopes on. And now they set their eyes on him as well. Because he's right there with them. Again, importantly, this is not, we'll see, they're saved anyway. So prosperity gospel, yay. They're like, even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't. So we see here is a, Material representation of the spiritual reality. Faithfulness to Jesus leads to life. This is what they're experiencing. Last week, the disciples are terrified when they see a glimpse of Jesus in his authority. This week, a king who's in charge of everything is alarmed when he sees the authority of Jesus. Small or great, 
when we have a bigger picture of the reality of who Jesus is. The giant statues, the giant crowds, the pressure on pain of death, they all diminish in the shadow of the king, the greater king of all kings. He again, Nebuchadnezzar, he's already acknowledged this previously, and he again realises, oh, this is the God of the people of God. He, he is the God. And a couple of chapters, we'll read again where he says, I decree this, he's the, he's the only God. He's got some more things to go through uh, before that happens, if you know the story. What do we learn from this encounter? What do we learn about uh, when life doesn't go the way we want? First, I think it's really instructive that they don't do this alone. It's not 300,000 onto one. It's 300,000 onto three. It's not a king onto one person. It's a king onto three. Sort of statue versus one guy, statue versus three. I mean, Daniel goes it alone in a couple of chapters' time uh, in, the, in the lion's den. But uh, the Bible does kind of point out that he was a fairly unique person in all of history. He's not like we, we don't necessarily identify with Daniel, but we do identify with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We need each other. We absolutely need each other. It is actually impossible to go it alone. When a threat comes to their lives, just, just the chapter earlier, what do they do? Daniel gets Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He says, we've got to get together. We've got to pray. We've got to ask God to help us. That's his response. That's the very first response to times of trouble and strife is let's gather, let's go to God. Let's gather, let's go to God. What do we do when life doesn't go our way? In our culture, what we tend to do is run to vices. We will run to <clears throat> things that will give us like a little dopamine hit to make us feel better. We'll run to alcohol or experiences. We'll run to, uh, I don't know, checking out, computer games, uh, spending spree, um, traveling. When life doesn't go our way, uh, we tend to because we're embarrassed, or we're afraid of what people will think of us. We tend to withdraw from community rather than lean into community. The exact inverse of the invitation of the gospel. Come and gather, bear one another's burdens. Go to the one who can actually help. Again, it's what the disciples do incidentally last week out of fear. It's what Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and Daniel do out of faith. They're like this is our only solution. It's the first thing we do. It's our first port of call. Let's come together. Let's go to the one who can help us. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, Brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is through his flesh. So we have boldness to walk into the very throne room of God. We can go right there. Not groveling like a slave, but confidently like a daughter or a son will go to their father. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. So saying we don't come to God <clears throat> mindful of all of the bad things we've done and everything that separates us from Him, but with a clean conscience. Not that those things didn't happen, but they've been, but they've been done Dealt with. They've been done for. Jesus has paid for those. We don't carry those into the throne room. We come into the throne room clean and pure and spotless and blameless and perfect like Jesus. It says, come, come into the throne room. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without without wavering. Says he who promises faithful. Again, we see this. This is an echo of the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. She says, man, what, what does the author of Hebrews say? What's the answer 
not just when life goes awry or life goes wrong or even life's a shipwreck. And you're like, there's no coming back from this. The writer of Hebrews says, do what they did, gather and go to the one who can help. And because we've been washed clean, we don't judge one another. We don't hold that over each other. There is no shame in the family of God. It's been dealt with. It is done. Like poor us of the Corinthians, we don't view each other from a fleshly perspective anymore. We used to look at Jesus like that, but we don't anymore. We see each other as we truly are, sons and daughters of the King. The, the great King, the holy King, the just King, the perfect King, the powerful King, the loving King. We need each other to remind each other of the goodness of God, to remind each other of the greatness of God. We need to remind each other, lest we be alone in the sea of hundreds of thousands bowing and go, maybe I'm wrong. We need to be alongside each other so that we can say, hey, remember, God is so much greater. God is faithful. He'll save us and if He doesn't, we're still going to be faithful because our hope is not in this life only. We're going to be faithful. Don't give in to Babylon's counterfeit gospel. What else? I'm struck by their humbleness and their boldness in the face of opposition. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they're not jostling for power. No one's trying to, you know, be the, be the big leader or anything like this. They don't waver. There's no hint of doubt in their speech or in their minds. Firm in their conviction, but they're not arrogant or presumptuous. Even when they're talking about God, they say, oh yeah, Yahweh can save us if he wants to. They don't say, yeah, well, we'll show you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, you fool, you idiot. They don't do anything like that. They're not presumptuous or arrogant at all. They don't slander their accuser. They answer with grace and truth. They face death and they're delivered from death. This is an, this is an amazing example, I think, for us in our day. Because although we're not literally surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people bowing down, we are surrounded by, I mean, in a, in a supremely connected internet world, we are surrounded by billions of people who are bowing down. And, and even if it's not the billions bowing down, it's often the loudest voices who are the ones saying, you've got to bow. We have set this thing up in our own, in our own image. You need to abandon your God and come and worship me, essentially is what they're saying. And those voices are very, very loud. They, they're in our regular media, media they're in our social media, uh, they're in our universities, they're in our governments, they're in our big corporations. I'm not trying to be like all consp you know, conspiracy theorists on you here. Uh, I'm just trying to say there are very loud voices saying abandon God and your faithfulness and your allegiance to him and come and align with us. Come synchronize with us. And those voices, they have made some as they've become progressively louder and the cost progressive, progressively uh, more difficult. Some have succumbed and they've abandoned and they've joined figurative Babylon and bow. That's why we need each other. But we don't stick up like the figurative middle finger. We need to be bold and humble. I mean, this is, again, this is, it's like a foreshadowing of Jesus in front of his accusers. He's firm in his conviction. He speaks the truth. But he, he never mocks them. Thirdly, we see what's most important to you will come to light when the pressure's on. So when the, you know, when the screws are tightened, uh, when the pressure's on, when the people come to you and say, if you don't do this, then we'll do that, it bubbles up to the surface what's actually most important to you. 
That's when you actually see, what am I willing to sacrifice? Or how, if I say Jesus is Lord, what would it take for me to not say that? And culture is very good. We see it even here. We see it today. Very good at turning up the pressure, uh, turning up the temperature to find out where is that line. Uh, another way of saying this is when, it's, when it gets really tough, when it's all on the line, we don't tend to rise to the level of our hopes, like this is what I, I hope will happen. We tend to fall back on what we actually most want. So if it's comfort, when the pressure's on, if we, what we most want is comfort, when it gets uncomfortable, we will withdraw and sink back into comfort. If it's ease, when it becomes uneasy, we will sink back into ease rather than like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego going, well, we're not after comfort, we're not after ease. We're going to continue to go even if it costs us our life. We're going for it. If we fear what people think about us or, or if what is most important to us is what other people think, when the crowd starts to bow, we will bow with them. We'll fall back to what we most want. And lastly, we need to remember Jesus is with us, uh, even in the fire. He's with them the whole time, and he's most tangibly with them in the fire. Jesus is with the disciples last week in the boat, in the storm, authority over the storm. He's with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego this week in the fire, authority over fire. We have to stop believing the prosperity gospel, even the prosperity gospel light that says, if God doesn't give you your idols of comfort and ease, then he doesn't love you or he's abandoned you or you failed him or you've displeased him or you don't have enough faith. We need to completely like surgically excise that out of our worldview, out of our understanding of, it's false, it's not true. It's only going to lead you to paths of destruction despair, depression, or grief. God loves you. He's not far off. He's not disinterested. He is invested. He's imminent. He wants intimacy with you. And he invites you into union with him. Like oneness with him through Jesus. It's the most like, wonderful, wonderful truth. It's the most wonderful reality. He doesn't abandon you in the fire. He's with you in the flames. Our goal is not to rise above the storm. Our goal is to go through the storm with Jesus because it's in the storm we become more like Jesus. It's in the storm we display to the hundreds of thousands of people watching. Uh, we're not going to bow. Imagine what those hundreds of thousands of people were thinking thinking, what are these three idiots? Even if you don't believe it, you're like, you just bow for a minute and then you just go back to your life, right? And they're like, no, no, no. We're faithful because he is faithful. And when they see them come out, uh, what happens? They get, they get promoted. Again, I'm not trying to say that's prosperity gospel. Uh, I'm trying to say that's the material sign of a spiritual reality that even though we die, we live with him in eternity forever. He's faithful and he calls us to faithfulness. We can't do it alone. No Christian Rambos. We've got to be in community together, encouraging one another, lifting each other up, praying with and for one another, bearing one another's burdens. You're not created to do it alone. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus I mean, even as we're reading this, thank you for the faithfulness of, I mean, these four men, really, including um, Daniel. Help us. We want to be like them. We want to trust in you and when it's costly. We want to trust in you when the pressure's on. We want to trust in you in the face of something uh, terrible and dangerous, uh, even life-threatening. We, please help us. We don't want to fear people. We don't want to feel what they think about us. 
Lord, our allegiance is to you in Christ. And so, Father, please help us by your Holy Spirit to live lives worthy of the calling. In Jesus' name, amen.